PCV2 remains one of the most uh, economically important pathogens in swine production, uh, not only in the U.S., but also globally. Um, while the virus is well managed in many swine herds, it has not gone away. Uh, it continues to cause issues, especially in subclinical forms. So even without you know, overt clinical signs, uh, PCV2 can still impact growth performance, feed efficiency, uh, herd consistency, those type of things. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining us in our illustrious podcast studios this week is Dr. Troy Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is a principal scientist and clinical project lead with the Beringer Ingelheim team. Troy, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. You and I have had the pleasure to know each other here through the years, and I'm excited to have a chat with you today. But Troy, for folks that haven't had the chance to meet you, why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Yeah, great. Thank you, Clayton. It's been a while since you and I have had a chance to sit down and talk. So when I got this invitation, I was absolutely thrilled. So yeah, for your listeners, my name is Troy Kaiser. I am a principal scientist with Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health, Global Innovation, Clinical Research and Development. Uh, my primary focus is on collect, uh, conducting the safety and efficacy studies for new vaccines and uh, those to improve our existing vaccines. Tell the folks more about what you do. A little background on myself. I grew up a on a ranch in South Central South Dakota and went to South Dakota State University for my bachelor's in animal science. And then when I did not get into vet school the first time I applied, uh, Dr. Jane Hennings and Dr. Eric Nelson there uh, at the SDSU uh, lab approached me with a plan to work on a master's. They had a national pork producers grant uh, and looking at PERS virus and mucosal immunity in boars. And uh, that made me Jane's first grad student. And a master's isn't necessarily something I'd really considered before that time. And uh, what a great opportunity that was. Uh, training on scientific method, study design, randomization, uh, bias and blinding and uh, statistical analysis are something uh, are things that we aren't always exposed to in vet school. And that rigorous training has been invaluable to me. It's uh, something that I use on a daily basis now. So after earning my master's, I was accepted to vet school at Iowa State. Following graduation, I worked for a mixed animal practice with quite a bit of swine in central Iowa. And uh, after a fairly short time, uh, I was introduced to a swine technical service veterinarian for Pfizer Animal Health, who recognized my background and connected me to a physician with their R&D clinical team. So after being there for about five years, I had the chance in 2009 to move here to St. Joseph, Missouri and become part of the Beringer team. Uh, here in St. Joe, we have the manufacturing facility uh, where the swine vaccines are made and shipped across the country and all over the world. Um, we have research and development and clinical and regulatory functions all working together. And uh, I guess so overall, uh, I've been leading clinical programs and conducting safety and efficacy studies for primarily swine, but also swine, uh, cattle and horses for like the last 20 years or so. Well, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You know, you're working on new vaccine technology, which is always awesome. Um, we certainly need all the help we can get out in the field. And Troy, you guys have worked a lot on uh, a new, different approach, a new approach to PCV2 vaccine. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Talk to us a little bit about the state of PCV2 and what maybe made you identify that as an area for improvement. And then, uh, you know, how do you, how'd you narrow that research funnel on what improvement opportunities were the most likely to actually help? Yeah. So as you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, PCV2 remains one of the most uh, economically important pathogens in swine production, uh, not only in the U.S., but also globally. Um, while the virus is well managed in many swine herds, it has not gone away. Uh, it continues to cause issues, especially in subclinical forms. So even without you know, overt clinical signs, uh, PCV2 can still impact growth performance, feed efficiency, uh, herd consistency, those type of things. 
Um, the virus does have somewhat of a high mutation rate, and multiple genotypes have been identified, PCV2A, PCV2B, PCV2D, etc. And uh, while we've seen a clear shift from genotype, uh, the uh, prevalence from PCV2A to PCV2D over about the last decade, uh, both are still clinically relevant. Troy, you guys would have had to do some, you know, safety and efficacy studies um, to get a new vaccine licensed and approved. Um, what sort of challenge isolates did you use in those studies? You know, you mentioned kind of the evolution over time. Um, does, your, does your new vaccine re reflect data that was done from more maybe recent isolates that are out there and more representative of today's genotypes than the ones 20 years ago when we were first making vaccine? Yeah, we have our uh, tried and true challenge model for the original CircoFlex product. Um, we, we continue to use that. Uh, there are studies out there where we have shown cross protection against different isolates. For PCV2D, we did use something more recent. Um, a lot of that's probably proprietary, and I can't really discuss where the where we isolated those and got those from. But but absolutely, as we've looked at uh, the, the virus emerge over the years, we've used more contemporary strains for our challenge studies. What uh, what message would you have for producers and veterinarians, Troy, that are thinking about this relative to the other PCV2 vaccines that are out there on the market? Um, you know, what sort of criteria would you be looking at to say, you know, is this vaccine better than what I'm doing today? Um, you know, should I be looking at this uh, even if I don't have a clinically obvious PCV2 challenge in my operation today? I'm really excited to be able to talk about this PCV2 AD vaccine now, it's been a huge part of my life for the last several years. Um, and so just talking about a few of the advances that we made with this clinical plan, um, not only do we have both genotypes in the vaccine, uh, the vaccine is approved for uh, healthy swine as young as two weeks of age. So this is a label claim we've had in Europe uh, for the original CircoFlex product for uh for putting it on the market there. And now we'll be able to make that same claim here in the U.S. with CircoFlex AD. Like CircoFlex, uh, we, it was important for us to demonstrate a two-week onset of immunity. So after a single one mil dose administered intramuscularly, we still see that protection as soon as 14 days later. Um, additionally, CircoFlex AD is the first product to receive at least a 26-week duration of immunity. So that's providing protection for a full six months. And for each of those different label claims, the USDA required us to do uh, specific studies. Um, all of those studies utilized CDCD pigs, so cesarean-derived, claustrum-deprived pigs. And that was a strong recommendation from the USDA. Um, they wanted to ensure that none of the pigs coming into the studies had pre-existing immunity to PCV2. So our licensing studies were blinded. Pigs were blocked by litter and randomized to treatment. Um, pigs were then vaccinated with CircoFlex AD. Um, for the two-week-of-age studies, pigs were vaccinated at 15 days of age and then challenged with either PCV2A or PCV2D, allowing us to look at the vaccine's efficacy against both genotypes independently. And then, depending on the objective of each of the studies, uh, the challenge was administered as early as two weeks post-vaccination for those two-week onset of immunity studies and as late as 26 weeks post-vaccination for the six-month uh, six duration of immunities. And so uh, these licensing studies, uh, the USDA does not look at typical production data, uh, average daily weight gain, body weights, that type of thing. Um, we really needed to show significant protection against three primary parameters and those are lymphoid depletion, lymphoid colonization, and viremia, or the, uh, the amount of virus circulating in the blood following challenge. And for each study and each of the variables, uh, prove the vaccine to be efficacious for both PCV2A and PCV2D. Very good. So it sounds like uh, this this product should cover a variety of different sequences that are out there, different strains that are out there. Whether you've got one of the newer ones that's a 2D or one of the more historic strains that's a 2A, you guys have done work to show that this, this product will protect against both of them. Is that a fair way to describe it? That's a great way to describe it. And uh, looking at trying to match the genotype circulating on the farm versus what's in the vaccine bottle, um, 
that that's really what we were what we were aiming for. You mentioned, you know, what's in the vaccine bottle, Troy, and one of the things that I know a lot of people appreciate about your guys' platform of Behringer is the three flex approach, right? Um, the ability to give multiple vaccinations with one injection to the pig. Uh, for folks that are doing that today and interested in switching, is it as simple of a plug and play as I stop using the CircoFlex bottle and I start using my new AD bottle? Regulatorily speaking, it's not quite that easy. Uh, the new vaccine is built on that same vaccine platform as CircoFlex. Uh, it, it's got the, the same dietic filtration, which makes the VLPs more immunogenetic and uh, just a, a good, clean presentation. Uh, it utilizes the same uh, adjuvant platform, so uh, the same incredibly safe adjuvant uh, that we use for the uh, Flex franchise, um, but it's currently not labeled for mixing the same way that CircoFlex is. Um, adding that to the label is something we're, we're actively pursuing and hoping to uh, eventually have in place, but that just comes with time and money, right? When they get to jump through the hoops, right? You get, you need to get the product labeled independently, and then you can go to the the combination labels. Is that a, the right way to look at it? That absolutely, absolutely. It's just a matter of getting those studies conducted. And from my understanding, uh, CircoFlex is going to remain on the market. It's still going to be a strong, dependable choice uh, for those mixing uh, those mixing needs. Very good. Any big takeaways um, from doing these studies, Troy? I mean, did you learn anything about uh, PCV2 or anything like that uh, beyond what we've already shared that you think the audience should know about as they think about their vaccine programs going forward? The thing that has been most interesting to me is following the shift of PCV2A to PCV2D. Mm -hmm. And uh, recent research has suggested that a shift from A to D might be linked to PCV2A vaccines. And they've been so successfully used uh, for such a long time. Um, we know that there's cross protection against genotypes. Mm -hmm. Those PCV2A based vaccines may exert a lower level of protection against PCV2D, okay. and that can lead to immune selection pressure favoring the D genotype. Hmm. Uh, and even with this shift, we have seen that 2A still remains clinically relevant. Um, but it's pretty cool uh, here at Behringer actively monitoring those PCV2 trends. Um, and what we've been seeing over the past decade made it clear to us that our vaccine and our approach to PCV2 uh, needed to adapt. You know, we talked about the efficacy and it sounds like you guys have done a lot of work to demonstrate that. We didn't really hit on the safety piece of it, Troy. You want to talk a little bit about the work you guys have done to, to help demonstrate the, the old veterinary motto, first do no harm, right? The safety profile of the vaccine. There's not a whole lot I can say. Uh, the Impran Flex adjuvant that we have for the Flex franchise, um, it, it is by far one of the safest uh, adjuvants I've seen in both the laboratory and the field. Um, in fact, for the CircoFlex AD license, we conducted a field trial, and uh, typically that's the last study required by the USDA for a license where safety is evaluated in client-owned animals. Uh, for this field safety trial, I used three different sites in three different states across the country. Uh, we enrolled 750 pigs, which were vaccinated uh, between 7 and 14 days of age, and of those 750 pigs, we did not see one single injection site reaction. Um, in fact, out of the 750 pigs, only 24 had any clinical sign of any type. And those were typical uh, farrowing room issues like lameness and lethargy. There were no, no safety concerns raised whatsoever. So from a safety perspective, CircoFlex AD continues the tradition of providing an incredibly safe product for baby pigs and producers alike. You mentioned the Impran Flex adjuvant, and I know the folks at Behringer take a lot of pride in their adjuvant and the safety profile with it. Um, for, a, for a dumb vet like me, Troy, right? You know, we get taught in vet school that kind of like sensitivity and specificity with a diagnostic test, that safety of adjuvants and efficacy of adjuvants sometimes don't work in parallel with each other, right? Sometimes there's a trade-off. I know there's proprietary information out there, but is there anything that you can share with the audience about that Impran Flex that, you know, highlights how it can be really efficacious and still have a good safety profile? Is there, I know you can't share the secret sauce, right? But what makes that one unique and, and really makes you guys so proud of, of both parts of it, the safety and the efficacy? One of the, the neat things about uh, how immunogenic that 
adjuvant is with our uh, with our different vaccines and our different antigens, and uh, the the fact that it's non virucidal. So being able to take a vaccine that uses that Impran Flex technology uh, and mix it with our modified live PERS vaccine, uh, that PERS vaccine is then still efficacious even with that uh, that mixing platform. So that is probably one of the coolest things about that adjuvant and uh, our, our ability to, to put it into the Flex, uh, Flex program, the Flex franchise. Well, Troy, you guys do uh, great work at Behringer. You make fantastic products. Really appreciate you digging into uh, this continuing challenge with, uh, with we've got with PCV2, uh, doing some good research, coming up with a really nice product, a new tool in the tool belt for pig producers here in the United States. Appreciate you doing the work and appreciate you coming on the show to educate the audience on it. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Clayton. Um, if your listeners are looking for more support or uh, advice on PCV2 protocols, I'd encourage you to connect with your Behringer rep, uh, or there is a website, uh, www.dynamicpighealth.com. Uh, and so, yeah, we should be able to, to, to help your listeners out. Well, um, you know, we couldn't do this without the listeners, Troy, so let's take a moment to thank them. Um, and in addition to uh, the Dynamic Pig Health website, we got a Swine Health Black Belt podcast website I should mention as well. Plug in real quick. Uh, you can find our episode with Troy on that website as well as our back catalog of lots of good episodes. Um, for Dr. Troy Kaiser, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you. We hope you found it educational and we hope you have a great rest of your day.